The threat of nuclear war is at one of its highest points in decades, and global tensions between major nuclear powers continue to escalate, primarily due to the Russian war on Ukraine. Just over a year into the conflict, we're somehow back to the Cold War-style proxy warfare between Russia and the United States that plagued the latter part of the 20th century. Not to be outdone, countries like Germany and China are ramping up their military capabilities, with Germany preparing to increase its defense budget by over $10 billion, bringing its total allocation to roughly $60 billion. At the same time, China has announced that its 2023 defense budget would increase by over 7% to approximately $225 billion, all while more and more training exercises are being conducted across the globe as a show of military might. With all these potential global conflicts brewing, it is only natural to ask, what's the worst that can happen? And unfortunately, there's a lot that can go wrong. With approximately 13,000 nuclear warheads possessed by nine countries worldwide, the misuse of nuclear technology threatens the lives of basically everyone on the planet. But when you're talking about things on the global scale, it can obscure the fact that some have it worse than others. That's because some people have been chosen to be the sacrificial lambs of a nuclear war. That's right, there's a concept known as the nuclear shield with very real people and places designated by their own governments to bear the brunt of that first attack. Today, we're going to look at the states that were designated to be sacrificed in case of World War III and how they came to be the unluckiest places on Earth when the nukes start flying. It all started in 1938 when Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann discovered a little something called nuclear fission which, to put it very, very simply, is a way to release the unimaginable amount of energy captured in the bonds holding together the nuclei of atoms by messing around with the heavy atomic particles like uranium and plutonium. However, this discovery by the Germans, and especially its potential for military applications, was no small secret. On August 2nd, 1939, Albert Einstein, who'd fled from Germany to America seven years earlier, just a month before Adolf Hitler became chancellor, wrote to President Franklin Roosevelt to share his worries about the potential applications of the new and rapidly expanding field of nuclear science. He recommended to the president that the government begin developing a weapon of its own in response and that it should start securing uranium and other required resources since German nuclear strike capacity could be, according to him, achieved in the immediate future. Following this warning by Einstein and other prominent scientists and combined with information gathered by American intelligence operatives, the U.S. decided the best option would be to counter the perceived German threat by building its own nuclear weapons. This resulted in the initiation of the Manhattan Project in 1942, where America developed the first operational atomic bomb. Of course, they considered this to be a defensive measure, the first example of the deterrence doctrine, which has been used as a justification for nuclear proliferation for the past century. But it was almost exactly three years from the start of the program that Little Boy, a 9,000-pound atomic bomb, was dropped out of the sky at 8.15 a.m. and detonated 2,000 feet over Hiroshima with a blast equal to 12 to 15,000 tons of TNT, killing roughly 140,000 of its 255,000 inhabitants. Three days later, Fat Man was unleashed on Nagasaki, a 10,000-pound nuclear weapon it produced a blast of approximately 22 kilotons and killed an estimated 70,000 people. The atomic bombings abruptly ended the Second World War, with Japan surrendering on August 15, 1945. In the aftermath, critical questions in the international community emerged, such as who possesses or is close to obtaining such a weapon? Who has the technology for it? And crucially, how can we protect ourselves? After World War II, the international diplomatic system, designed to resolve conflicts between great powers, had collapsed entirely. The old European states had nearly destroyed themselves in a brutal fight against the Axis powers, and were now unable to assert their influence in the way they had been pre-war. The previous international settlement system had crumbled alongside the European states it originated from. 
allowing the U.S. and USSR to flex their muscles and compete for global superpower status, regardless of the consequences for their citizens. With fewer colonies and considerably less war damage or casualties, the U.S. was lifted out of its worst depression by the massive industrial effort required to supply and sustain the war. This surge in production created millions of jobs, helping to reduce unemployment rates from around 25% in 1933 to less than 2% by 1943. Furthermore, the U.S. gross domestic product grew considerably during the war. In 1939, the GDP was about $80 billion, but by 1945, it had more than doubled to approximately $230 billion. Figuring out the effect of World War II on a country's future and involvement in world affairs can be tricky. U.S. defense spending reached almost 40% of the country's entire economy by the war's end, and it never really slowed down after that. To help you understand this better, Think about spending $1 million every hour, all day and night, for an entire year. It would take 576 years to spend the same amount as the U.S. during World War II. The American people put all their resources into supporting the war, which led to a strong defense industry focused on keeping its special place. The U.S. took control of many areas during the war and needed a constant supply of military equipment and soldiers to protect them. It was remarkable that the Soviet Union could hold its ground, despite over 20 million total fatalities and a 60% loss of industrial capacity. The war enabled the Soviets to establish an effective organizational structure and retain their Eastern European satellites. This post-war period witnessed the transformation of Western colonies into formerly independent states. For instance, in 1960, countries like Belgian Congo, Benin, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Chad, the Congo, Cyprus, Gabon, Côte d'Ivoire, Madagascar, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Somalia, Togo, and Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, joined the United Nations after gaining recognition as independent states. Meanwhile, the USSR and U.S. were busy building military bases into interconnected networks and setting up intelligence facilities and assistance programs. The U.S. took on the responsibility of providing military power and security in Southeast Asia after defeating the Japanese military, but not without confronting the limitations of the new bipolar world order. The Korean Peninsula, for example, was divided along the 38th parallel with the Soviets arming the North and the Americans overseeing the South Korean military. The U.S. even helped maintain Taiwan for the KMT forces that had lost the Chinese Civil War by 1949. As global issues increasingly involved capitalist and communist superpowers, it was expected that former colonial powers would want to keep economic connections with their former territories, preparing for a future world where military and resources would be crucial. For example, France and Britain found ways to maintain their influence indirectly. The French Empire was replaced by the French Union, which continued to benefit from labor, resources, and profits from regions in Africa, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, and Polynesia. On a related note, France would later conduct 210 nuclear tests in Algeria and Polynesia between 1960 and 1996. Similarly, Britain ensured it had access to a stable fuel source by controlling uranium mining in African countries like South Africa through British-owned businesses, helping it avoid the political and financial challenges of nuclear power. But the idea that nuclear weapons would end conventional wars was short-lived. During the 1970s, conflicts raged in Angola, Burundi, Cambodia, Guatemala, Iran, Jordan, Lebanon, Nicaragua, Pakistan, the Philippines, Rhodesia, and Sri Lanka. Wars persisted in the 1980s with the Iran-Iraq War, resulting in around a million deaths, and other conflicts either began or continued in the Philippines, Angola, Guatemala, Afghanistan, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Cambodia, Mozambique, and Peru, with the Soviet Union, U.S., or South Africa involved in nearly all of them. The nuclear age had not eradicated the sacrifices of soldiers and civilians worldwide. In fact, it seemed to be quite the opposite. 
The U.S. pursued an ambitious program of domination in all domains, land, air, sea, information, and even space. Harold Pinter highlighted this during his 2005 Nobel Prize acceptance speech, noting that the U.S.'s official policy was full-spectrum dominance. In the role of a supreme power during a tense global struggle, American leaders felt responsible for managing world affairs, which sometimes meant making sacrifices, including potentially sacrificing some of its own people in the event of a nuclear attack. The United States began the construction of silos for Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, to counter the potential threat of a Soviet first strike attack during the Cold War. The two primary types of ICBMs were deployed in these silos during the early years, the Atlas and Titan missiles. The Atlas missiles, first deployed in 1959, was the United States' first operational ICBM. It had a range of approximately 9,000 miles and could carry a nuclear warhead with a yield of up to 4 megatons. Atlas missiles were initially placed in above-ground launchers, but were later moved to underground silos for better protection. The Titan missile, a more advanced and powerful ICBM, was introduced in 1962. It had a range of about 10,000 miles and could carry a 9-megaton nuclear warhead. Titan missiles were placed in hardened underground silos, making them more resistant to a potential enemy attack. Some of these silos were also equipped with a two-stage liquid-fueled rocket system, which allowed for a quicker launch. The first silos were placed in several states across the Great Plains, including North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. These states provided vast remote areas that allowed for the strategic placement of silos, ensuring the safety and security of the missile systems. However, the presence of these silos also meant that the people living in these states were at a higher risk of becoming targets in the event of a nuclear attack. While the placement of the silos in these states aimed to provide a strong deterrent against potential aggression from the Soviet Union, it also put the lives of the residents in these areas at risk. In the event of a nuclear conflict, these states would likely be among the first targets, as enemies would aim to eliminate the United States' ability to retaliate with its own nuclear arsenal. This would leave people in these states vulnerable to catastrophic destruction, making them potential sacrifices for the greater good of the country's defense strategy. However, the people living in these states weren't the only ones who could experience a nuclear attack. Given the increasing power of nuclear weapons, it was becoming apparent to American leaders and the public in general that anyone could potentially be a victim. So in the early years of the Cold War, the U.S. hurried to develop a complete national security plan, utilizing every possible resource to their advantage. For example, the national highway system was built to improve troop movement and enable the evacuation of large cities in case of a crisis. However, faced with the danger of nuclear attacks, it was unclear whether people would be better off seeking shelter or fleeing from cities to avoid potential devastation. The National Security Act of 1947 established the Department of Defense and the CIA. While President Truman set up the Federal Civil Defense Administration, or FCDA, in 1950 to address internal safety, risk assessment, and strategic preparations, the FCDA faced the daunting task of assessing and responding to novel and evolving threats to America's national territorial security. Under Eisenhower's administration in 1955, it advised every family to keep a seven-day supply of food and water on hand for an atomic emergency. The initiative called Grandma's Pantry attempted to penetrate public consciousness with slogans like, Grandma was always ready for an emergency. However, as most urban pantries were above ground and vulnerable to atomic bombs, the public eventually realized that this strategy was insufficient. Before the duck and cover era ended, the U.S. Department of Agriculture introduced its doomsday food. In the early 1960s, a bulgur wheat biscuit dubbed the all-purpose survival cracker. This somewhat underwhelming solution fell well short of the desired full-spectrum dominance. It wasn't until September of 1961 that President John F. Kennedy dramatically addressed Americans in Life magazine, opening by saying, My fellow Americans, nuclear weapons and the possibility of nuclear war are facts of life 
we cannot ignore today before going on to present an ambitious plan. No, nukes would not be dismantled and banned forever. Kennedy had a better idea. The idea was the fallout shelter program, an enhanced run for cover operation in the event of a nuclear strike that could save up to 50 million Americans. The National Fallout Shelter Survey and Marketing Program aimed to identify buildings with potential as fallout shelters, offering protection from residual radioactivity rather than the blast itself. Fully reinforced concrete blast shelters would have cost nearly $200 billion, a price deemed too high, especially considering that U.S. military spending in 1961 was over $54 billion, a whopping 9.2% of that year's GDP. So citizens were left with the luck of the draw in the event of an urban attack. One possible reason these attempts at urban civil defense seem so half-hearted is that they actually were. It was all a bit of theater to keep the population from panicking, since in the eyes of many defense strategists, there was only one thing that really mattered when it came to this ultimate form of civil defense, the United States geography. This is why the first intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, silos were placed in the Great Plains states in 1959 because their geography gave them three unique advantages. First, missiles in this area had the shortest distance to travel to the Soviet Union, around 5,000 to 6,000 miles, flying straight over the North Pole. Second, the distance of missile silos from both American coasts increased the likelihood of detecting a nuclear submarine launch signal in time for an effective response. And third, the missile launch facilities were located in the least densely populated areas of the United States, making them the least politically costly sacrifice. In simpler terms, those locations were selected because they had the lowest population density in the continental United States. As a result, any potential loss of life would have a more negligible political impact, making these areas the most suitable choice for a protective shield. Over 1,000 Minuteman missile silos and 100 corresponding launch control facilities were built between the mid-1960s and early 1990s with the rationale that certain states and their populations could serve as absorption pads for enemy nuclear arsenals. This decision was made despite the rapid development of sea and air nuclear launch capabilities and without any sort of democratic process guiding the efforts. You might wonder why an enemy intending to inflict damage on the United States wouldn't target major cities like Washington DC, New York, or San Francisco. To understand why it made sense to people at the time, you've got to understand two things. First, nuclear proliferation occurred at an alarming rate in the 1950s and 60s. The UK, France, and China ranked third, fourth, and fifth in the nuclear arms race, achieving their first atomic weapons in 1952, 1960, and 1964, respectively. Amidst this rapid nuclear proliferation, defense strategies lagged. Military planners often believed in the first strike doctrine, where striking an enemy's nuclear arsenal first in a conflict offered a significant advantage. This defensive thinking led to placing land-based missile silos far from civilian population centers, government buildings, resource networks, and financial hubs. It was believed that a nuclear attack on the US would target one of the hundreds of Atlas, Titan, Minutemen, and Peacekeeper missile sites across the Great Plains, from Texas to North Dakota, New Mexico, to Montana. These sites, along with nearby people and ecosystems, would absorb the enemy's nuclear arsenal, acting as a nuclear shield, or sponge. Second, civil defense planners relied on the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. Early in the Cold War, missile technology advanced so that a full nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the US could occur in under an hour. By 1955, the U.S. possessed over 2,422 nuclear warheads, while the Soviet Union had 200. Over time, these numbers inflated, and nuclear deployment by land, air, and sea reached a terrifying level of precision and omnipresence. By the time the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, 
the United States and the Soviets had amassed over 90% of the world's 58,342 nuclear warheads. If any country launched a nuke, global destruction would likely follow. Thus, the U.S.'s primary national defense strategy rested on the promise of total sacrifice, creating the illusion of absolute safety. International nuclear politics operates on a massive contradiction, evident in the paradox between deterrence and denuclearization, or disarmament. Deterrence, the concept that possessing nuclear weapons and threatening massive destruction can ensure national security, contradicts disarmament, which posits that not having a deadly weapon prevents its lethal use and extends this notion to international politics. The American deterrence policy's dubious nature lies in its varied presentation and handling by different leaders. For example, when President John F. Kennedy signed the United States into the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty on July 25, 1963, he stated from Moscow, this treaty merely gives us time, a breathing space, until we have finally abolished these weapons of mass destruction. Considering his inexpensive fallout shelter plan from just two years prior, Kennedy might have genuinely hoped for a miracle. However, his actions didn't reflect such aspirations. In 1972, Richard Nixon signed the first Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, known as SALT-1 with Leonid Brezhnev affirming both nations' right to maintain the strength necessary to defend its independence. Nixon acknowledged that in an unchecked arms race between two great nations, there would be no winners and losers. By the time Reagan, an avid military spender, took office, Kennedy's partial nuclear test ban treaty stood no chance. In 1983, Reagan proposed the ambitious Strategic Defense Initiative, a system armed with space-based X-ray lasers to detect and deflect incoming nukes. The government spent $30 billion on the project over the next decade before Bill Clinton abandoned it in 1993. Reagan aimed to use the military-industrial complex and its scientific resources to render nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. It's important to note that since the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, International efforts to prevent nuclear weapon proliferation have been continuous but notably ineffective. In 1946, the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission was established to promote the peaceful use of atomic energy and prevent military applications. The European Atomic Energy Community was created in 1957 with similar goals, and the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, was founded that same year. Despite the IAEA's role as the global watchdog for preventing nuclear materials from being diverted to military use, by 1980, six countries possessed 55,755 warheads. By 1987, at the height of the Cold War arms race, seven countries had 64,452 warheads. And though the total number of warheads around the world had been reduced to roughly 13,000, the number of countries with actively deployable nuclear weapons has increased to nine with Russia, the United States, China, France, United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea all possessing them. The threat of rogue or dictatorial states with nuclear capabilities is often cited as a reason to maintain the U.S.'s nuclear arsenal in the era of credible deterrence diplomacy. This policy shift occurred after Bill Clinton abandoned Reagan's guidelines, which aimed to prepare the U.S. for a prolonged nuclear war. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't guarantee peace. Consider Russia, which has increased military spending by over 30% since 2012, primarily focusing on nuclear warheads and control capabilities. As a result, it's unlikely the deterrence doctrine will fade anytime soon, leaving ordinary people fearing the escalating and potentially irreparable violence stemming from this rationale. In the mid-20th century, some experts thought that nuclear weapons had made conventional war unnecessary. But over time, this theory has not panned out. The spread of nuclear weapons seems to have actually made it more likely that they will be used, since they let countries employ the threat of their use as protection for non-nuclear attacks, and also lead to military action if a nation is thought to be creating nuclear weapons. 
For example, President George W. Bush initiated a lengthy, costly, and devastating war in Iraq based on the assumption of Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program, which ultimately didn't exist. The concept of a credible nuclear deterrent is intertwined with the inevitability of tensions and conflicts in international politics among nations of various strengths. The ideologies of first strike advantage and MAD rely on the potential for violence between global actors at any moment, making the threat of annihilating countless innocent lives a necessary component of a country's internal security, which understandably causes unease. The need to protect U.S. national security interests by any means necessary and the idea of a just war or just use of force are prevalent in American nuclear politics. These concepts are often linked with just wars, considered necessary, and defending national security by any means as an inherently just cause worth fighting for if necessary. Despite the Geneva Convention prohibiting the use of force against civilians, some military experts use the distinction between peacekeeping and peace enforcement from the UN Charter to defend their right to use force in certain situations. International agreements notwithstanding, force is justified if it helps achieve a clearly defined outcome, particularly if the underlying principles or interests are deemed significant. Brigadier General Smedley Darlington Butler, who left the military in 1931, denounced the theory and strategy of warfare as legalized murder. He criticized the arms industry for profiting massively during wars, while ordinary soldiers faced death. Butler's testimony sheds light on the dark side of American internationalism, as he recounted his role in serving the interests of big business and Wall Street throughout his military career. Instances of Agent Orange used in Vietnam, atrocities committed by American-funded death squads in Latin America, and abuses at Abu Ghraib in Guantanamo Bay demonstrate the often distorted image of the Good Samaritan state. Ultimately, the pursuit of a just cause and the necessity of defense often intertwine, leading to sacrificial violence in the name of propagating American values, which sometimes can include sacrificing a country's own people.